We have a few minutes before we adjourn. You'll see microphones uh, around the room. Um, and we also have some questions that have been coming in, as I saw them on my phone um, during the event, from our webcast participants. So if anybody has questions, you might uh, think about uh, preparing them now. Um, we, we did get one question. Uh, John, that I'll, I'll direct to you, and I think your mics are on there now. Um, you talked about the haves and the haves not. Some, some uh, businesses will do better in the stock market going forward, but one of our webcast viewers asked the question, are we experiencing any kind of an asset valuation bubble? And if so, how much risk, risk does that propose or pro pose for the economy? Sure, yeah, I think there's, a, there's an awful lot to be concerned on asset bubbles. Uh, there. Uh, you know, academic research has been wonderful uh, on bubbles telling us when we had them. Uh, not so good on when we're going to have them. And uh, I always, uh, in my heart of hearts, I'm a fundamental analyst. And if I'm uh, looking at stock prices, I recognize fully that, for example, the S&P might be trading at 18 or 19 times earnings. That's longer then that's higher than the long-term average. The long-term average is about 16 or 17 times earnings. So there, there is great concern that we are overvalued and, and heading for a bubble. I think it's a mistake to look at multiples in a vacuum or myopically. I think you have to look at multiples relative to interest rates and relative to inflation. And when you factor that in, if you go back to 1950, the 10-year treasury today is yielding 250, 270 in that ballpark. Uh, but since 1950, since World War II, the aftermath of World War II, uh, the 10-year Treasury's averaged almost 7%. I think it's like 6.87%. So we have a four or 500 base point discount relative to that. Um, I could plug that into an earnings model and justify a PE of 24 times the market. Does anybody want to pay 24 times the market? I certainly don't expect you to. I'm not going to, so I don't want you to. Hmm. Uh, inflation's the same thing. Inflation, uh, historically, 3.5 or 4%. Our Federal Reserve and the, the Bank of Japan and the European Central Bank has quintupled the size of their balance sheet, and we can't, still can't get 2% inflation. The Fed's core measure we learned on, Friday, on Monday was 1.5% on a year-over-year -year basis. So uh, if you're discounting above-average profit growth, profits are at record levels, yet we're discounting those near historic lows in interest rates, I don't think we're excessively valued in the equity market. I don't want us to, you know, there are so many ways to value the market. You can Gordon growth, dividend discount, a lot of them really don't work because it's different this time because the Fed has quintupled its balance sheet. But, you know, there's an old uh, rule of thumb called the rule of 20. And uh, for all the academic work, the rule of 20 simply states that on average, uh, the market's multiple plus in annual inflation equals 20. So if we are below 2% on the Fed's primary inflation indicator at 1.5% and 18.5 times on the market, we're right there at the rule of 20. So uh, it can be argued that we're not overvalued yet in the equity market. Um, you know, there are, a lot of people are tempted to raise rates. In fact, I was tempted a couple of weeks ago, and some of my analysts talked me out of it, and I'm glad they did. Um, and that's part of the collaboration we have in our, in our team, and I think that's so critically important. You know, a lot of people are talking about 3,000 on the S&P 500. We're at 2820 today. Um, to get to 3,000, you really have to be able to justify margins of 10 or 11% with sales growth of 7 or 8%. You know, I'm not, I'm not sure. You know, we could get there. The market, the market could be overvalued uh, longer than you can have money to put into it, and the market can be undervalued longer than you can stay solvent. So it's always, you know, finding that balance. So I don't see it in equities. Uh, an argument could be made on, on, on sovereign credits, which is why we want to uh, underweight Japan and uh, uh, sovereign bonds in Europe. Great. Interesting. Thank you very much. One other question from the webcast, and then we'll throw it open to you. This one's for Patty. You put some pretty sobering numbers up there about the increase in housing prices. You also showed how important in-migration is to our community, our economic growth. Um, when will that rise in housing prices really impact in migration and therefore our economy? Well, I think we've actually started to see some of that influence of the housing prices on our in migration. Um, if you recall from that chart, 2015 was really the peak in migration year that we had into this area. As we look out over, you know, in 2016, 2017, we saw um, 
still positive in migration into this area, but those numbers have started to soften a little bit. Um, so certainly we are seeing that the cost of housing that the expectations too regarding the housing costs, not just from the cost standpoint today, but rising mortgage rates, that type of thing are starting to play into people's decisions about where they will locate and where they will stay. So I think we are starting to see that already. Okay, we have time for just a few questions from the audience. Is there anybody out there that would be brave enough to ask the first question? <laughs> Yes, in the back, Gina, there's a, right behind you. Thank you for asking the first question. <laughs> uh, this is Dawn. I put this on the webcast. I'm just curious what John thinks about the Bitcoin currency. Do you see that that is going to be up and coming in the future millennial group after the millennials? Look at the time. Thank you all for banking with Vectra. <laughs> Appreciate everything. I am a... Uh, I am uh, very concerned uh, about the millennials diving in. You know, I talk to uh, uh, a lot of millennials on our team and uh, in the community, church, and I ask, why are you involved in this? And they say, because it's going up. <laughs> and I, you know, I think of 1999 with all those internet incubators, you know, and all these advisors calling me, well, how low can these things go? And I said, zero. So uh, I'm concerned about the cryptocurrency um, what I'm very excited about is the whole blockchain idea and the blockchain concept. So I think it's important. In fact, uh, my team and I, we're working very hard on looking for investable opportunities within the blockchain arena from a security standpoint, from an investment standpoint. Um, I, I think that is the more sustainable uh, longer term opportunity. The, uh, you know, to go with the first question, if there's any sort of mania going on, uh, like the tulip situation centuries ago, um, I would have to characterize cryptocurrency in that area. Now, um, uh, again, um, I may be missing out. I may be a dinosaur, not embracing the, the vision that some of these millennials have, but um, you, know, you, you even think about gold. You know, it doesn't pay a yield. It costs money to store. Everyone buys it as an inflation hedge, but we can show you a chart pretty easily what gold did when there was inflation in the 1970s and what gold did recently when there wasn't inflation. And uh, you know, I'm not convinced that's the case. So uh, in a nutshell, I'm concerned about cryptocurrency. I, I worry about A, the volatility, the lack of liquidity. Um, from a currency standpoint, you know, I'm old school. I like it backed by a full faith and credit of a government and a central bank supporting it. And you have neither of those conditions with crypto, but blockchain is a very different dynamic, and we are we are uh, doing our best uh, figuring that out and figuring out the best investment opportunities. Great, thank you. Great question, Don. Anybody else? Time for one more. <clears throat> one more over here. Yeah, just speak really loudly. can potentially impact um, how the new tax reform could potentially impact homeowner affordability in Colorado if we're talking about people's ability to afford the higher mortgage interest rates and the higher uh, home prices when you have a double of the, the standard deduction and you have a 2 to 3% decrease in tax rates across the board. Will that help bolster domestic um, purchasing of houses and consumer spending and how that impacts Colorado specifically in our businesses? I'm glad to speak nationally, and then if you want to mind, uh, after my deodorant fails, I'll pass it to you, and you can, uh, you can handle the, the local stuff. Um, I think there's a couple of things. Um, you know, I, like any piece of legislation, there's imperfection associated with it. So when I look at the national economy and I look at uh, financial market impact, um, in spite of the warts on the, uh, on the legislation, the idea that you can get 1% GDP this year, 1% uh, GDP just to the consumer next year. And we, one thing I failed to mention, you know, we could conceivably have another government shutdown next week. But once we get that budget finally and not go with the CRs, the continuing resolutions, that's going to be $250 billion in spending. 60 for, in, for defense, 60 for non-defense, 80 for 
hurricane relief, and 30 for um, infrastructure. So when I look at factors like that, that is impactful to the economy. Uh, you know, locally there are some struggles and uh, people will have to make some adjustments, uh, but the overall economy I think is important. And a final point I'll make on the housing market, you know, there's a great commercial, um, I think it's Honda Odyssey, with a young couple that's dating, evidently they're on a date and there's a family behind them at a restaurant and there's a screaming kid, and screaming kids, and they're like, we're never getting married. And the next thing you know, they're in the church. And then they're on a plane and they're screaming kids, you know, we're, we're never having kids. You know, she says, I'm pregnant, you know, and then the next thing you know, they're, they're buying a Honda Odyssey. And I just think that um, whatever technology played, whatever societal mores played, um, what might have happened to a generation at age 25 several decades ago might have been pushed back to age 35 currently. And I just got to think that all us millennials who, who bought in 2007 and got suckered, and now, now we're finally above break even on our home prices as we sell. And we, as, because there's been buyer's confidence when rates were zero. But now I think you're in a situation where the boomers can have seller's confidence. And I think those millennials who love to live downtown, love to rent, um, as they get a better handle on the generational low of interest rates. I remember 1999, I bought a house and I got seven and seven eighths and I was insufferable. I told everybody, friends, strangers, um, I think you're gonna see this race to 5% over the next handful of years as the Federal Reserve you know, jacks up interest rates gradually, but the 30 year fixed gets closer to 5%. I think you're gonna see more demand and I think that will be uh, a sustainable 3% plus growth rate, mm -hmm. and I think housing will have a lot to do with it because the millennials will be uh, buying, you'll have sellers and buyers confidence finally in, in the housing market. For the local tax situation, do you want to take sure, that? Sure, let me, um, on the local side, I think that while yes, our housing prices are some of the highest across the country that we're seeing now, at least from, from some of our competitor locations, we also have some of the lowest residential property tax rates. So our property tax rates are, I think, fifth lowest in the country right now. So that certainly, as, as home buyers are looking at the total cost of the package, they, they definitely see that our property taxes are lower. So. My concern about the whole tax situation, about the non-deductibility of some of those housing costs are more in those high cost, high tax areas, as opposed to Colorado where we don't have both of those pieces of the puzzle there. Interesting. Thanks everyone for joining us today. We really appreciate your attendance. Special thank you for our two speakers, John and Patty, and to our partnership with the EDC and the Chamber. We hope we've given you a good starting point, some good information for a successful 2018. And as always, Vector is always here to support you in the coming year. Thank you all very much.